Welcome to the Exercise Science Playlist and a brand spanking new piece of research. Resistance training recommendations to maximize muscle hypertrophy in an athletic population. Position stand. And so it's the A-team of researchers here, including this guy, Schonfeld, Helms, Phillips, many household names in the exercise science research field and they cover areas such as rest volume set endpoints frequency and so for many of you watching this this information is not necessarily revolutionary but there are certainly interesting points that you can take away and so what i've done is time stamp the video so you can skip to parts that may be of more interest to you and skip other parts that you just feel aren't as important for you right now and as always with these videos my goal is to take a paper a new piece of research and simplify it to give you practical applications you can take away today. I cannot tell you exactly what you must do. Use exercise science as a guideline and then adjust it and mold it to what fits you. And this is a fairly large paper with so much information in it. So as always, I have referenced it and I would advise you, if you find it interesting at all, please read the full paper. Constructs of hypertrophy. Mechanical and potentially metabolic stress experienced by skeletal muscle cells during resistance training results in an eventual upregulation in muscle protein synthesis. That was a long sentence sentence, which ultimately leads to protein accretion and measurable changes in muscle size. And we know that repeated dynamic contractions with progressive overload are an effective strategy for creating this phenomenon in muscle, aka get you yoked. So first of all, how does muscle grow? Well, I do have an individual playlist on this for any of you interested. Myofibrils within a skeletal muscle fiber are the contractile unit that contain sarcomeres and produce force following neural recruitment. Evidence suggests that increases in muscle fiber size in response to weeks or months of resistance training primarily occur as a result of regular increases in myofibrillar muscle protein synthesis and myofibrillar accretion. Muscle fibers can increase in length, and this is known as the increase of sarcomeres in series. And whilst the increase in length of muscle fibers is viable, this is more associated with specific situations, such as the hyperextension of a muscle where it is in a cast, for example. You should have seen the other guy. However, and importantly, it is the increase of sarcomeres in parallel, which is how your muscle fibers are growing in response to your resistance training that you are performing. In individual muscle fibers, this has been referred to as conventional hypertrophy. And so this is what you may be familiar with. But we do also have another area of muscle growth which is slightly less researched, slightly more controversial, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. In addition to this evidence, a comparatively limited number of studies suggest a sarcoplasmic hypertrophy may also contribute to a small degree of the observed increases in muscle size in response to various types of resistance training. And so sarcoplasm is the intracellular fluid within skeletal muscle. At present, the evidence suggests that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy may play a limited role in the hypertrophic response to training, and this response may be trans transient to facilitate myofibril accretion. Some research suggests that the phenomenon may be more specific to higher volume, higher repetition, although limited evidence precludes the ability to draw strong conclusions on the topic. Again, I cannot stress enough that this paper is quite large. There's so much nuanced discussion in here. I simply cannot cover it in one video. It would take hours and hours. It's just a very wholesome read and a YouTube video could never do justice to it. And so what are the key considerations for increasing muscle size. First factor, load. How much weight are you sticking on the bar? Individuals can achieve comparable muscle hypertrophy across a wide spectrum of loading zones. As I've said before on this channel, you can build muscle using multiple rep ranges, multiple set structures, multiple intensities. As long as you have those underlying principles of overload, challenge and consistency, you can be successful. There may be a practical benefit to prioritizing the use of moderate loads for the majority of sets in a hypertrophy-oriented training program. Well, why would that be? Because a moderate load would allow you that sort of moderate rep range, which allows for repeated stress on the muscle, the muscle fibers, repeated dynamic contractions. And so if we're looking for the maximal approach, if you like, then for many people, moderate rep ranges are highly effective. We hear about that sort of eight to 12 rep range, that's not bro science, that's a very decent range to be given, which can induce that metabolic stress. Preliminary evidence suggests a potentially hypertrophic benefit to employing a combination of loading ranges. And so this is very interesting for those people who get stuck to one ideology and this is right and this is wrong. This can be accomplished through a variety of approaches, including varying repetition ranges within a session from set to set, or by implementing periodization strategies with specific 
specific blocks devoted to training across different loading schemes. And so that is the key takeaway. Don't bind yourself to one specific model of hypertrophy when it comes to your load. Be creative, have fun, experiments. You can change from month to month, from week to week. You have microcycles, mesocycles. You can change within a session. You can use pyramid training, reverse pyramid training. There are so many ways you can challenge your muscle and that can be fun and exciting also. That intangible factor that can benefit us with our training. And so the gaps in the literature, the effects of hypertrophy across loading zones have primarily been studied in binary terms, comparing distinct loading zones, for example, heavy versus moderate. While this provides important insights from a proof of principle standpoint, it fails to account for the possibility that different combinations of loading zones can be employed in program designs. And so research likes to nicely package things so they can test it. Okay, and so that's good, that's useful. But in reality, in the gym, it is not always in reality this amount of weight for this amount of reps for three sets, for example. And so be aware that whilst research, of course, interload is extremely useful, it's perhaps more traditional in the way they compare things to perhaps the actual reality in the gym which is that people use varying styles and there's no way to be fair that researchers could research every single different combination that people use because how long is a piece of string volume a dose of approximately 10 sets per muscle per week would seem to be a general minimum prescription to optimize hypertrophy although some individuals may demonstrate a substantial hypertrophic response on somewhat lower volumes evidence indicates potential hypertrophic benefits to higher volumes which may be of particular relevance to underdeveloped muscle groups and so higher volume training is absolutely evidence-based to be successful. Of course you can use higher volume, but again, you have to remember there is that point of diminishing returns where we have junk volume. Just doing a ridiculous amount of volume in a session doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get more gains. Hence, at some point, a high number of sets per session exceeds the anabolic capacity of muscle to synthesize protein so that any additional volume results in wasted sets. However, no attempt to be made to quantify specific threshold in this regard. Scrutiny of existing data suggests that it may be appropriate to limit to 10 sets per muscle per session. When weekly volume exceeds this amount, splitting the volume across additional training sessions may help to maximize anabolic capacity. But what an increased volume does allow you again is that repeated work, the repeated stress on the muscle fibers, the repeated dynamic contractions. Although empirical evidence is lacking, there may be a benefit to periodizing volume to increase systematically over a training cycle. It may be prudent to limit incremental increases in the number of sets for a given muscle group to 20% of an athlete's previous volume during a given training cycle and then readjust accordingly. So when increasing volume, don't just throw loads and loads on top. You know, that's a fairly decent guideline they're giving you there. And then we get to frequency. Significant hypertrophy can be achieved when training a muscle group as infrequently as once per week in lower to moderate volume protocols. There does not seem to be a hypertrophic benefit to greater weekly per muscle training frequencies provided set volume is equated. But of course, if you are training less frequently in the gym, it would be beneficial for you to use those compound movements, those big bang for your buck movements, your bench press, squat, military press, for example. And so when you think about all of these factors, load, volume, frequency, you have to understand they're not in isolation. They're all connected in terms of how you program them. So if you want to reduce your frequency per week, let's say three sessions per week, you then have to consider another factor, exercise selection. And that's where you may want to bring in those compound exercises to make the most of those infrequent sessions. And then you may want to have a look at your load, for example, to make sure that you're adequately challenging the muscle. It may be advantageous to spread out volume over more frequent sessions when performing higher volume programs. A general recommendation would be to cap per session volume at 10 sets and when applicable, increase weekly frequency to distribute additional volume. And so a nice guideline for you there. And so now we get to rest intervals, which is something that is actually very overlooked, I think, in fitness communication, but absolutely vital for how effectively you can perform in your sets. As a general rule, rest periods should last at least two minutes when performing multi-joint exercises. And so personally, when it comes to hypertrophy programming, I like to use a one minute rest for myself, that just fits my needs. But of course, if you're using a heavier weight, you're gonna have a longer rest between sets. If you're using a lighter weight, you can reduce that slightly. So again, you have to adjust to those different variables. Shorter rest periods, 60 to 90 seconds, can be employed for single joint and certain machine-based exercises. And so here's a takeaway they give. These findings suggest a potential benefit to using shorter rest periods in single joint exercise, as this conceivably may help to enhance muscle buffering capacity and thus have a positive effect on performance when training with moderate to higher rep ranges. At the very least, 
least it will make workouts more time efficient. We're almost there, exercise selection. Hypertrophy oriented resistance training programs should include a variety of exercises that work muscles in different planes and angles of pull to ensure complete stimulation of the musculature. Programming should employ a combination of multi and single joint exercises to maximize whole muscle development. Where applicable, focus on employing exercises that work muscles at long lengths. Okay, so multiple angles, good range of motion, recruiting those motor units, challenging the muscle from different angles, different muscle fiber directions, absolutely is a common sense approach. Again, these standard movements can be absolutely great, but don't restrict yourself to them. Don't fear using different variations change equals adaptation, but always maintain that progressive overload in your training and always maintain your eye on your goal. Don't just go off on all these random patterns and sort of get away from what you're training for, but absolutely do take a variety and mold it to work towards your goal. And lastly, almost there, set endpoints. And so AKA training to failure. Novice lifters can achieve robust gains in muscle mass without training at a close proximity to failure. As an individual gains training experience, the need to increase intensity of effort appears to become increasingly important. So absolutely vital when you're thinking about your programming, place yourself on the spectrum of training experience. Highly trained lifters may benefit from taking some sets to momentary muscle failure. In such cases, its use should be employed somewhat conservatively, perhaps limiting application to the last set of a given exercise. And so remember, when you are training to failure, that that may mean that you need more recovery time between sessions. And so that's something you have to factor in to your programming. That's something that affects your frequency of training as well. If you are training to failure in your sessions, then you may need to train less frequently in the week to give yourself those rest and recovery days in between. Confining the use of failure training primarily to single joint movements and machine-based exercises may help to manage the stimulus fatigue ratio and thus reduce potential negative consequences on recuperation. This can also have a safety application. If you're using failure on single joint and machines, of course, it can be safer to implement then, for example, large barbell compound movements. Older athletes should employ failure training more sparingly to allow for adequate recovery. Periodizing failure training may be an option whereby very high levels of effort are employed liberally to prior to a peaking phase and then followed by a tapering phase involving reduced levels of effort. And so really what they're telling you there is that, of course, you can use failure training. That is your choice. But how much you use it in your sessions is something you need to consider and safety, your recovery between sessions, your recovery between exercises within a session. These are all factors you have to consider your training experience and competency with lifting also. Research to date has exclusively employed multi-set designs where one group trains to failure in every set while the other group does not train to failure. Training to failure over multiple sets tends to compromise volume load, which in turn may impair hypertrophic adaptations. And so that is a gap in the literature for you to consider. And so I hope this video was useful for you in a takeaway fashion. There are so many areas there discussed. And of course, I would encourage you to read the paper in more depth, but I hope that just by watching this video, you can now sort of go away and look at your programming and you might tweak a few things and hopefully be successful in your fitness journey. I'm James Linker. Thank you for watching.